it's a pleasure to introduce Shari Sath Roy. You know Shari for now almost two years, three years, something like that. Yeah. It's a pleasure to have him visit us from UC Berkeley. So Shani was a student of Brian Grenfell, Simon Levin, and Ned Hindred. So three advisors. It's very, very unusual. At Princeton, he did his PhD in quantitative and computational biology. That's the program. And he completed his BSc from University of Victoria, Berlin, and then Brescia, which was also very, very well known. I happened to meet Shadi because of his work that he was doing with Simon and Brian. And we have a couple of interesting threads that are ongoing. But Shadi has done remarkable work. He's a Miller Research Fellow at UC Berkeley, very, very prestigious fellowship. He's going to go great places after this. One can uh, hope. <laughs> uh, hopefully to UVA. Uh, more than one reason for him to join UVA, but we'll see what happens. But uh, he has a series of very nice science papers in the last two years. So hopefully he'll cover some of it and then talk about extensions. With that, Shadi, over to you. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Amala. So I thought I would do a talk that covers for completeness and obviously for historical reasons, how this started off in 2020 and then where we are today. And intermingled with this are going to be ties to other ideas from influenza and some more current work as well. And hopefully that will elicit some ideas and hopefully people will like and maybe we can have a small discussion afterwards. I always find it funny to have to introduce COVID-19. I guess everyone's lived through this and everyone knows what it's like. But while we're here, I might as well uh, introduce the disease dynamics across scales. And I think again, to this group, this is something that everyone knows, but we know that it's very complex, Biocomplexity Institute has it in the name, right? So there's a lot of scales, a lot of processes, and we have to capture all of these. I'm actually gonna focus on only a small subset of this and try to argue that some simple models can still give you some insight. But at all scales, this is what it looks like. Here you, you've got what we already know happens, emergence of new strains, and then cellular and tissue transmission, and then we're building up within host kinetics, immunity and transmission, and a lot of the talks can focus on this. So you can think an individual is infected and they transmit to a susceptible person or someone who's partially susceptible or someone who's fully immune, what happens? How does it go? And some people can get breakthrough infections. And you can think that already there's lots of complexity being built on. What about individuals that are immunocompromised? That's kind of a cross scale thing, right? Individuals that are immunocompromised with prolonged carriage maybe can give rise to new mutations, who knows? Strength and duration of immunity so now we're rising. So this is at the individual level, now more population. What about strain transcending immunity? So complete immunity means things. How does that wane? Well, is it wane or is it drift? Is it the virus, the host? And then what about community immunity? So this is everyone's dream, right? Achieving communities where the virus can't come in. And then what about coupling and global spread and stochastic persistence? So we know that this is important to couple, right? And then obviously, once you're here, in a strange way, you get new strains and new strains that spread, and depending upon whether they spread or not, so in a strange way, it connects back. The next step is back to the emergence of the new strains. So this is a nice cycle. We wrote in supplementary figure in that perspective. I can send to anyone who's interested. But it kind of summarizes, or at least we think it summarizes, the main processes that happen across scales. So that's just to we'll narrow down as we go. So the next, narrowing down further, something I'm interested in. So it's this triangle, shedding, immunity, and transmission. How are they connected to each other? How do they impact each other? And so obviously I can argue again that understanding that is pretty important, both as a fundamental knowledge and to try to control disease, control SARS-CoV-2, right? So how does this change epidemiological dynamics? What about evolutionary outcomes? And what about control measures? So again, this is gonna be the central key. And that's mostly on, it kind of comes across the cycle across the multiple levels but certainly it's very much focused on immunity and transmission. So now to introduce COVID itself. So where are we at or what do we know? Well, there's obviously a bunch of unknowns right now, still today, especially true in 2020, but I would say that still a lot of it today is still unknown. What about immunity after infection? What about immunity with different, against different variants? What about immunity after vaccination? Where do new variants come from? A lot of different hypotheses. I think it's hard to know. And also it's hard to know, potentially we can find out where new ones have come from, but we don't really know where the future ones will come from, right? Not necessarily. And obviously what's the clinical impact? So 
people, a lot of acute infections, but what's the longer term potential burden? And that I think is a massive unknown that's gonna definitely shape the next decades, probably. So I think, again, don't have to really drive this point too hard, but it's important to untangle the different processes that are driving these things, right? And you want to also investigate what might happen in the pessimistic scenario or the optimistic scenario. So we can have an idea, guide our intuition as to when might something happen depending upon what the input parameter is. And so, yeah, as I said, I would argue that simple models can be useful here. And so that's a lot of my work is very simple models and hopefully they guide one's intuition. So the first thing I want to touch on is what happens when you have a slow trickle of infections and vaccination. So here, the simplest case you can imagine, assume that there's constant level of infections, turns out everything falls up. And you can obviously, the nonlinearity that emerges from the dynamics, the infection process just aren't there anymore because they're assuming constant infection levels. And you can actually end up figuring out what individual immunity you need to get the community immunity. And then you can add bells and whistles, like a seasonal switch or pre-existing immunity and get some, again, some intuition for what might happen. But obviously, as we know, constant infection levels where you are effective is around one is not usually the setting that we're at. We're, we're not adjusting control measures all the time to keep this constant. But nevertheless, you can get some analytical relations on the duration of individual immunity required to reach community immunity, and then a bunch of other interesting equations that one can derive intuition from, and that's published in Interface in 2021. So if someone's interested. That's good. But of course, the next thing you tell me is, but of course, dynamics are important. So, and I completely agree, dynamics, dynamics are important. So what if you incorporate them? How does the strength and duration of immunity matter? And what happens if you have, as we know, a lot of vaccine hesitancy, people choosing to accept vaccine or choosing not to. What about seasonality? We know that many pathogens exhibit seasonality. What happens with COVID? What if? What can we say with this? And what about non-pharmaceutical intervention? So that's a big one, right? People wearing masks, people choosing to stay at home, lockdowns, different mandates, et cetera. So how does that impact dynamics? All to do with the strength and duration. Of so how does that change? And this is the schematic illustrating this. I described it a little bit earlier, but basically individuals with natural immunity or vaccinal immunity, and then they can, when do they wane? Do they not wane? Do they wane a little bit to some partially susceptible state or do they wane completely to be resusceptible? So this is the basis of a paper in science published in 2020. And I'll go through the model and some of the results. Basically the basic modeling framework to many of you will seem very intuitive, I'm sure. So you've got the basic model is takes an SIR model and an SIRS model and interpolates between both. So we can call it maybe the SIR bracket S model. SP are primarily susceptible, the, the first susceptible, you, everyone enters this class fully naive. Basically. Get infected, some contact rate, then you're, this is your primary infection, then you recover at some rate to the recovery class. So that immunity, we have complete immunity. Then immunity wanes, the one over delta is the average duration of immunity. Enter this primary, this secondary susceptible class where you're partially susceptible. And then from that class, you enter the second, you can get infected again with some reduced epsilon force of infection. So this is the relative susceptibility epsilon. Alpha here is another key parameter. So epsilon reduction in susceptibility, alpha reduction in transmissibility focus. So if you set those two to be zero, then you just get an SIR model, right? You're fully immune, you stay fully immune. If you set both of these to be one, then you can sum the first infection, second infection, and then you get your SIRS model back. And it turns out that this transmissibility it quantitatively affects the dynamics a little bit, but qualitatively, it's pretty similar. So for analytical tractability, we can just set that to be one and focus on this reduction susceptibility. What happens when, if you go from zero, you're completely immune to something where you're basically, you have perfect reduction susceptibility to something like one where you're resusceptible at the same rate. So how do these interplay together? So epsilon, we can, can think of this as like the strength of immunity, right? If you're very, if immunity is very strong, you can't get reinfected. If immunity is very weak, after waning, you get reinfected. Non-pharmaceuticals and seasonality can all have an interesting interplay. So we focus on three scenarios. And so here's the scenario NPI, so non-pharmaceutical interventions. We basically dim transmission in the period of dark gray and light gray led normal seasonal cycle using New York City-derived climate transmission rates. 
So you can see there's three different potential scenarios, a longer one, then relaxation, and then a short one, just to illustrate what might happen. And already you can see in these very busy plots that we can describe a little bit. So here's the time series. Here's the epsilon, so SIR, S here, very poor immunity after waning, basically none, the back to being fully susceptible to very much stronger immunity here. And then the colors are just illustrating those different values so you can see them apart. And then the line types are the primary and secondary infections. So the first thing to realize, and basically the, the reason why I illustrate all three scenarios here is just to show you that a lot of different things can happen. So if we look at this one, the first thing to realize is the primary peak doesn't change. Well, that's kind of intuitive. Why should immunity, which is this axis, have any impact when all individuals are susceptible? So that makes sense. Okay, so that we, we've intuited that through that. The next interesting thing that I think occurs is that you get a non monotonic relationship between the second peak here, right? So the second peak occurs, turns out, interestingly, it's quite a bit higher if you have an intermediate value of epsilon, quite a bit lower if it's small or large. Okay, so you can see the peak kind of follows this pattern. Turns out you can actually get the reverse pattern if you look at a different scenario of non pharmaceutical interventions. Yes? What is epsilon? So epsilon is the reduction in relative susceptibility. So basically, if it's one, it's as susceptible as a primary infection. If it's zero, you're completely immune. Yeah, so it's a measure of measuring some kind of continuum of immunity. And so here, you get the opposite relationship. So some intermediate immunity decreases in people. So why is that? Well, it turns out this simply due to dynamic resonance, basically. So you're basically pushing peaks around, you hop on the seasonal cycle, and then it's delayed, but bigger second peak if you push the peaks around. Obviously, without seasonal forcing, this doesn't happen. But it's to show that you can actually get some pretty intricate results depending upon what happens. So if you just look at the time series and you say, ah, this grows much faster, so immunity must be much worse than if it didn't. But it turns out that's not the case. Just the timing of the peak actually matters. So that's already, we see that adding in a little bit of complexity does kind of affect the dynamics. A lot of this stuff was done before vaccines emerged. So what if you incorporate vaccination? In the simplest way possible, one class here, one compartment, individuals are vaccinated, they can get vaccinated. You assume vaccination are random, but only the susceptible individuals actually gain immunity from vaccines. So those in SP and SS, they're vaccinated at a certain rate. And the vaccinated individuals don't get infected, but their immunity can wane at potentially a different rate than this delta. And then again, for simplicity, reduce the number of equations, assume that they wane back into the secondary susceptible. So vaccinations are akin to this kind of like primary infection. So again, we can show analytically, there's a unique dynamic equilibrium if the reproduction number is greater than one. Otherwise, the disfree equilibrium. And then if you get a an analytical expression for the minimum vaccination rate required for eradication. And obviously, back then, you know, that's what everyone's going for, right? A good vaccine. How much do we need to vaccinate to eradicate? Well, unfortunately, we're not there, but it's good to examine nevertheless. So you can see this is the long-term burden, right? The endemic equilibrium, the fraction of population affected at equilibrium as a function of the vaccination rate for different durations of immunity and then different susceptibility to secondary infections. So or SIRS, poor immunity, better immunity as you get closer to 0.5. And here you can see, basically, if you've got lots of vaccine, right, you, you can reduce the disease by a large margin. Only if the vaccine immunity is poor and the susceptibility to secondary infection is high, will it be much very difficult. And unfortunately, we're probably in a setting where the duration of vaccine immunity is poor, and unfortunately, you can get infected fairly easily after this initial period of wane. So we're in the poor setting. But then we can, again, illustrate the proportion of susceptibility to vaccinate daily as a function of the susceptibility to secondary infection for different duration of vaccine immunity. And to me, what's interesting here is if the vaccine prevents secondary infections after waning pretty readily, then it doesn't really matter how long this initial period of like strain transcendent immunity is or complete immunity is. But again, as I said, we're probably more in this region, so the duration wouldn't matter. And unfortunately, we're not reaching our durations of vaccine immunity is pretty poor, so we're not reaching this eradication threshold. With our model, we can now examine these synoptic medium term landscapes. So very simple, examine four different scenarios. And as you'll be able to intuit immediately which one we're in just by looking 
at the different captions. Here we've got in the bottom row, what if you have a vaccine? In the top row, what if you don't have a vaccine? Here, robust immunity, here, poor immunity. And you can see if you have a robust immunity and a vaccine, incredibly, you know, cases, this is the fraction of individuals in each class, right? If you have robust immunity and no vaccine, then you can get us another computers out, you get some peak, but eventually you have enough population immunity that it goes away. And poor immunity, even with the vaccine, you get this like this, right? comes back. And that's where we are probably, right? So, you know, this kind of work can, yeah, we can show this highly dependent upon the strength and duration of immunity and you can have a huge range. And this is just using this additional model, right? This slightly refined SIRS kind of model, right? So I'll add one parameter in and lots of different outcomes are possible. So I did allude to this a little bit earlier. What if you have vaccine heterogeneity? Well, that's gets kind of interesting, right? People choose to get vaccinated or not, and then that also might impact their contact rates. So I can choose to get vaccinated and choose to stay at home and decrease my contact rates, or I can choose to not get vaccinated and go out and increase my contact rates. You know, there's definitely some coupling there. We can examine this very simply with a toy model here. Again, we're not actually putting in behavior that's about as well as doing this, but we're just doing this in a very simple way. What if you've got two groups and they're interacting potentially differently with each other? Using this framework, we can then compute, depending upon the relative contact rates between the groups, when can you achieve eradication or not? It turns out that if you have enough, this is the fraction that refuse vaccines. So if, you, you know, if you're in this region, you can't eradicate it. So if you have enough vaccine refusers or the contact rate is high enough, it'll be very difficult. And that's again, intuitive. And then we can compute these eradication thresholds. And again, not to go through all these plots in detail, but you've got the fraction population that refuses vaccine, the proportion that of vaccine adopting susceptible to vaccinate daily. Again, the line types are the duration of vaccinal immunity, and the columns are the strength of immunity. And the rows will be a homogeneous population, increased transmission associated with vaccine refusers, or decreased transmission associated with vaccine refusers. So the first thing to notice is if you decrease the transmission, then that's good news, actually. If the, the vaccine refusers stay at home, they don't, they don't take their vaccine, but they stay at home. It doesn't really matter too much, right? It's fairly flat. It doesn't have a substantial impact on how many people you need to vaccine, which is the opposite if those vaccine refusers increase their transmission rates, right? And that's again makes sense if you have a lot of people that are choosing to increase their contact rates and they're not the ones that are getting vaccinated, and the people that are getting vaccinated, assuming the vaccine can have an impact on transmission, then all of a sudden you got to vaccinate more of them, right? So that's where this linear, this strong increasing function happens. And yeah, it's a log scale. So increases very fast. And then I didn't show this figure, but the refusers can also affect the synoptic view of the medium term dynamics. And so you can get some slightly counterintuitive or non-intuitive results, maybe not counter, but once you think back through it, it makes sense. And then there's some additional considerations I didn't mention here that we examined. So obviously the main thing is what if you have heterogeneity and transmission and immunity? So maybe the first infection is really bad in some individuals, long immune, better immunity than if it's you know milder and you can, Qualitatively, again, very similar results, some quantitative differences. What about pulse vaccination? So this is a, you know, we're assuming constant vaccination rates. You can take the other assumption and assume you have tons of vaccine, you just vaccinate a bunch of people at once, what happens? And again, there, the, the landscapes change a bit, but the overall message stays the same. And what about different seasonal patterns? So that's kind of interesting. So we were using, you know, those plots in New York City data, but what about Delhi or Jakarta? You can see the R not slightly different, all right? Basically flat for Jakarta, closer to the equator. So what happens then? Well, you can actually, we have an online interactive application where readers, it's actually been pretty useful. People have enjoyed going on and changing the parameters and seeing what happens to the dynamics. So yeah, basically I think the main take home message of this part is it's good to use these simple models to guide our intuitions. Now, the big question that emerged after we started doing this stuff is you've got two dose vaccines and there's jurisdictions that extend the space between doses. So what happens? Well, we can actually use our model to extend it to multiple doses, V1 and V2 now, dose one, dose two, with this interdose rate, right? So one over omega is gonna be the average interdose period. Now these individuals, their immunity can wane and they can get infected another epsilon now epsilon one, epsilon two, at some reduced rate, and then they can recover. And then we can 
examine the evolutionary considerations, and I'll discuss this in a bit as well. So basically, there are a lot of different moving parts. We went from a much, well, Balthazar thinks it's high dimensional model to a much even higher dimensional model now. <laughs> so now it's going to be really hard to say much, but we can still investigate this and look at all the different potential scenarios. So that's a paper in 2021. Remember, we had four plots, four different scenarios. This is actually only looking at one of these potential plots becomes eight. So there's many more, and without showing them, there's not enough time to go through all the different scenarios. But just to illustrate what you can do with this refined model, still look at what happens when you have something like less robust natural and vaccine immunity, probably what we're dealing with now, right? So immunity is not too robust. You don't have complete immunity, and maybe for a short period of time, and then you become susceptible again. What if one dose shorter and weaker immunity or longer and stronger immunity, right? So what if it's equivalent to two doses or not nearly as good? And you can look at a different strategies, one dose strategy all the way to the recommended two dose strategy or 12 weeks or 24 weeks. And again, you can see the immune landscapes or as we call them immune landscapes, the split of the population, all the different types, lots of different options, much more than before. The next panel here is cases in red, severe cases in black, the dashed line, and then the top is just to illustrate, schematic illustrating the proportion of people that are vaccinated. So you can see that the one dose strategy in the longer and stronger immunity case is actually quite good, right? You, if you start vaccinating right when the peak starts rising, you can snuff the first peak and then you know, build up a good immunity and then it's fine. In the case where it's poor though, you can snuff the first peak, you reduce it quite a bit, and then it can just come back to haunt you later because all these people are now these categories, right? And then these can get infected again. And then immunity is poor, and then you get massive further cases later on. And then turns out in the recommended two dose strategies, if you in you know you have limited vaccines early on, well, you don't really do much of the first peak at the but then you get the benefit in the long term that right? you reduce the cases longer on. And then if it's one dose is equivalent to two doses, then that's a very bad strategy, obviously. The interesting thing here is a 24 week interdose or 12 week interdose period, you can see you can actually get, for example, on the poor one dose immunity case, you can actually get almost the same reduction early on. And then you stave off the worst cases, such as you know these big peaks later on. And the idea here is you get the people their second dose afterwards. So then they do eventually mature into this broader immune phenotype. So Again, just to show that you have to think about these things before making decisions. And obviously, within the absence of clinical data, well, one should really do clinical studies to understand this, but you can still use the simple models to tease apart what's going on. Yeah, so then this is just summarizing what you might happen. The cumulative cases across the medium term, then this is the severe cases and the total cases, depending as a function of the interdose period and the one to two dose immune response. So you can see that there's an autonomic relationship, right? If the interdose period is too long, then you got more cases. If the interdose period is too short, then you got more cases somewhere in the middle and minimize it. And the same, basically, the total and severe cases are very similar, just different scales. And then this is the, again, just as I showed before, you can get a minimum. Again, we're thinking in terms of we're trying to get eradication. With the simpler model, you can get a nice quadratic and get the thing analytically. Now, this minimum for assist administration rate is a solution to a cubic, so you can show it exists, but you have to solve it numerically, depending upon how, what's the four weeks spacing, 12, 24, 48 weeks, and as a function of the relative susceptibility after weighing one dose or weighing two doses. And again, so now this is a solution to a cubic, and you can solve it, and again, lo and behold, if you've got a short interdose period, then you know, if you take a transect here, it's very similar, so the two dose unity after the relative susceptibility after two dose immunity is much more, uh, much more important. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Take a transect here. This one's more important. Take a transect here. You see that the one dose have a big impact. If you have a big interdose period, then all of a sudden, the characteristics of one dose immunity become much more relevant. Take a transect this way, and the two doses is still important. So depending upon what you choose, again, it's going to make a big difference to what might happen. But I think this is wishful thinking, because we're not going to be any close to eradication anytime soon, unless you develop new vaccines, which I'll talk a little bit about in a bit, actually, take some insights from influenza. And then the big 
thing here too with the dose spacing the doses or not spacing the doses is what might happen evolutionarily. So lots of different thoughts. So we'll build on this paper by Grenfell et al. 2004 in Science, where you look at the phylogenetic curves. It's a very simple model. So at the function of immune, so you have immune pressure and potential net viral adaptation rate. And then basically it's a concave down function, strength of selection. So if strength of selection increases with immune pressure and the viral abundance decreases. So if you have no virus, then you've got no potential viral adaptation. If you've got no immune pressure, no selection, then you also have no adaptation. Somewhere in the middle will maximize it, right? So we have three different compartments that are potentially undergoing this, right? You have the individuals who've been infected, and then their immunity is waned, or individuals with one dose immunity whose immunity is waned, or two dose immunity whose immunity is waned. And again, we don't really know where those different infection classes lie on this curve, right? So we can look at three scenarios. So here's scenario one, low potential viral adaptation. All three are pretty good. Here's scenario two, one dose, lots of potential net viral adaptation. So you've got this intermediate immune pressure and then two doses of natural immunity are good. And then the worst scenario, right? You have high potential in between three. So flu generally is seen as being somewhere here just for the virus, you've lost potential adaptation. And then again, not showing everything, but just to show you one snapshot of what you can have. So you can look at the different strategies. So one dose, 24 interdose period or recommended two dose strategies, depending upon the scenarios. You can see that if you're in scenario one, it doesn't really matter what strategy you do, right? You basically get low viral adaptation, which is the y-axis on all three cases. The purple scenario, however, or the blue scenario, it will really matter what kind of strategy you pick. So again, you have to, before deciding what you do in the absence of clinical data, you have to think about these things carefully and know what could happen or what could not happen. And so it's interesting to play with these models to get some qualitative insight into what, what could be important in the future. And again, lots of additional considerations. Can I ask a question? Yes. Can I question? So, yeah, 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 sure. Can you just describe what you mean by immune pressure? Just Yeah, so about... here it's just basically, it's very, very like abstract, right? Like it's just, you're imposing some, the virus is growing, you're imposing some, you've got some antibody response or some immune response that's snuffing the virus down and preventing further growth. And so if you've got no immune pressure, then the virus just grows, but also might not explore this potential genomic space, right? So if you've got high, then you might explore, but it might be so strong that you have no more viral Okay, got you. Yep, yeah. a good question. And so yeah, lots of different things to consider. What if you switch dosing strategy? So one thing we did find is if you switch the dosing strategy from a one dose initially to then the 12 weeks or 24 weeks, you can, again, mitigate a lot of the bad effects or to the recommended one. So basically the idea is always make sure that individuals get their next dose to prevent this kind of potentially nefarious outcome. And vaccination ramp up, right? So right now we're assuming this constant rate. What if you ramp it up or different vaccination rates and then refusal as well? Another big uh, question. And then, yeah, lots of, Lots to think, lots to think about and see and supplement the paper, or just ask me and we can discuss. So the next big question here was, again, we're following the times. Now we're in 2021. There's vaccines. There's two doses. People are getting getting vaccinated. And there's this question of vaccine nationalism, right? So you got two countries, a high access region, may or may not want to give vaccines to a low access region for various reasons, right? They want to protect, want to keep them to be able to vaccinate more of their own people. Well, what's the impact here, right? What's the global evolutionary potential? What about the infection levels? What happens if, the, you know, you can potentially have, if you have enough infections, you can drive transmission and have these secular increases where transmission increases over time. But what about immigration? Let's like couple the regions. So we published this again in 2020, late 2021. The first thing you can do is examine the simplest case. So back to the original model that I first showed and assume that they're decoupled. So the two regions are decoupled and there's nothing. The only way that they're coupled is through the vaccine share. So now you can look at different fraction of vaccines allocated by the high access region, HAR to the low access region, and the average infections in equilibrium across both countries. And we assume both countries are the same size. We also rely on this assumption in supplements, et cetera, to what if you've got one big country or one small country. And here, the the rows are whether symmetric, so how's transmission in each one? So you can think transmission might be impacted by lots of different things, right? Non-pharmaceutical interventions in play, population density, et cetera. So if it's symmetric, they're the same, 
you have less transmission in the high axis region or less transmission in the low axis region. And you can see that, well, when it's symmetric, it's kind of obvious, right? You vaccinate a lot and then eventually you reach herd immunity in one and then, then it's good to shift. You know, that's the way you, you minimize this by reaching this minimum across both. When you have asymmetrical transmission, the results are a lot less intuitive. You can see that the minimum of infection levels happens at a different place along this allocation axis. To understand this a little bit more cleanly, we can take it apart and look at a case where you have asymmetric transmission, a very low global vaccination rate, and look at the equilibrium infections in each country. So the low axis region is in dashed and the high axis region is solid and the vaccine allocated. So you can see you're trading off one, basically you're trading off one infections in one country for infections in the other. So that's not very good, right? It's kind of hard to make a decision based on this. But if you increase the global vaccination rates and all of a sudden you get rid of this issue, all of a sudden you can allocate lots of vaccines and then reach this much lower equilibrium infections. Right, so all, all the way up to here, this is the low axis region. You can share all the way to here at no cost to the high axis region, even more than 50%, because you have this asymmetrical transmission. So again, it's just showing you that it's not immediately obvious what the right approach is. You can use these kinds of very, it's very simple. The only coupling through is the vaccine allocation to get some intuition. And then if they're coupled, I'm going to show this figure and not describe it, just to show you how complicated it can be. So lots of different things, right? So now we're looking at a scenario, natural immunity contributes more to potential viral adaptation. We have viral adaptation going on. We've got immigration on this axis here. You can see the immigration rate and then different transmissions on this axis, lots of different potentials. And you can see there's, it's not clear, lots of non-monotonicity, lots of different special cases. So bottom line, things are complicated when you start coupling and making these models more complicated. So generally you can see yeah, sharing vaccines is good and prevents transmission and prevents evolution, but what's the devil's in the details when you look at these specific things? And again, lots of different considerations. What if you increase transmission? Things can change a bit. What if I alluded to this? Asymmetries in population sizes, the vaccine allocation scheme. So I didn't show much on the facts. You can superimpose them on top of the sharing and see when might one strategy be good or another strategy be better. And again, some interactive applications, et cetera, to look at. So then we did this small comment with Caroline and Brian on potential global scenarios. And I thought this is good to look at. So basically, you have a global vaccine strategy. If you stockpile or you have equity, and this is just a comment piece, their opinion, I guess. And you have rate of immune waning, slow to fast. What might happen? And then, you know, you can have vaccine hesitancy bringing you back in the opposite direction, right? Like if you're... If you're almost, it's like you're stockpiling more vaccine. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you've got lots of equity and slow immune waning, then you don't have much evolution and very few infections, but the opposite case, lots of evolutionary potential and lots of boost needs for boosters. So bottom line is we don't really know. Well, we do know we're not in here, but we're somewhere just above region. Immun immunity wanes fast. So as I alluded before, I thought it's good, you know, we're, kind of pessimistic view on vaccines now, right? The vaccines are, they prevent severe disease, they do their job, it's really good. The immunity is not long lasting. You get these new variants that can really go over the immune barrier. So in influenza, there's been big pushes towards these universal influenza vaccines. And there's actually now big pushes towards pan-coronavirus vaccines. So what's the road towards universal vaccines? You get a very broad protecting vaccine that prevents transmission and protects against lots of different variants. So for universal influenza vaccines, we wrote this review in 2019. You know, basically we argued again that the importance is to understand the tie between shedding and transmission. If you understand that, then you can, depending upon the vaccine characteristics and depending upon what the cross scale dynamics look like, you can really potentially get good developments towards these universal influenza vaccines. And that's gonna require tight integration between empirical and theoretical work. And I think, yeah, like your group here is, very well amenable to doing these kinds of things, right? To try to understand where, what might be good characteristics of these universal vaccines and quantifying the natural and vaccine limitations of transmission is central. And I think a lot of this COVID work has also showed this, right? So this is in this Journal of Infectious Diseases in 2019. But continuing on with influenza, we recently wrote this policy forum looking at the economic and epidemiological considerations for influenza vaccines. So here we've got a narrow vaccine. So 
not very broad, a very broad vaccine, many strains, many variants, however we call them now, on the duration of protection. So if it's months to years, things might change, right? And here we compare and contrast the economics and the epidemiology and what might happen. So in the broad case, you don't have to update the vaccines as much, more effective against pandemic viruses and then smaller protection gaps for seasonal viruses. On the economic side of things, you don't need to update the vaccines as much, you have more predictable demand, then increased breadth leads to greater demand. So you get a consequent increase in market size. On the other hand, if you have a narrow vaccine, for the epidemiological considerations, as we know, you have to get repeat vaccinations, right? And then the immunity lasts longer, then you have to get fewer of these. And then the impact of annual vaccination can be amplified by accumulating population immunity, right? So if a lot of people are, have population immunity, then you prevent the emergence. And then the economics of this, again, is that if you have narrow potential for higher demand volatility year to year, and the country purchasing is not coordinated or staggered, and maybe you get a reduced market size over time. The bottom line, this piece is really showing you that the economics and the epidemiology are intertwined here, right? Because you need to be able to get the vaccine makers to buy into this, right? You want them to buy into these broad vaccines. So how does this tie to COVID? Well, we actually discussed this a little bit. And if you have SARS-CoV-2 transitions to mostly to an endemic virus that mostly causes mild illness, and the future vaccines against coronaviruses probably might focus more on pandemic protection than routine immunization. However, the long COVID could change this balance, right? So if you have a really high burden in the long term, then it might make more sense to really try to prevent even these infections, even if they at first appear mild. So lots to think about here. And I think the economics angle is something that is very important as well to consider. So now this is, we're almost near the end, the last piece that we recently did that I want to highlight. So how are the dynamics of SARS-CoV-2 variants influenced by vaccine breakthrough infections? So this is again, inspiring when you see all these breakthrough infections happening, how might that change the dynamics? How might that change the number of individuals that get an infection at the end? And then what's the impact of immunological uncertainties and transmission heterogeneity? So again, you know, lots of these, we don't really know what happens. Some individuals might just be immune after their first infection. Others might just get repeated infections. How does that change the dynamics? So this is a preprint on Meta Archive, if anyone's interested. So simple model again. So I'm going to drive this point home. Two subpopulations. You've got a susceptible population and the vaccinated population. And the vaccinated populations can get breakthrough at some rate. And this is this rate here, the relative susceptibility to infection due to vaccine. And this is the proportion of population. And this is a susceptible fraction and the vaccine fraction. We assume really high R naught. And we assume here that we vaccinated lots of people enough to control if the R naught was deep. So you have very few susceptible populations. Susceptible left. Most people are in vaccinated class. And you can see that if you increase a little bit this relative susceptibility to infection after vaccinal immunity, it doesn't require much to really drive this infection here, right? The slope increases dramatically. And the susceptible, unfortunately, for them, almost all of them were infected in this, in this simple epidemic with the slide with slightly higher or not. So if you're not vaccinated and you're in this setting, that's really bad, right? Like it's almost guaranteeing infection. And you can take a look when it's a bit on a setting that's a bit across R naught. So that one is just a little illustration. You've got here absolute numbers, absolute fractions, and relative to initial. So this I find this a bit easier to see because we're not normalizing. So in this region, almost all individuals that are susceptible are infected, but the R naught of the invasion variant and the relative susceptibility to infection due to vaccine immunity. So it doesn't take much in either direction to really lead to lots of susceptibles getting infected. The vaccinees do slightly better, but again, doesn't take much to really, if you think about it, 0.07, so that's 7%. The reduction in susceptibility is 93%, right? And then you're already, you just have to go up in the R-naughts a little bit and you get lots of infections in the vaccine. So, Basically, this combination of susceptible and breakthrough infections can significantly promote infections of invading variants. So it's kind of a, another pessimistic outcome that we can see with these simple models. So if the R-naught increases, it could be very bad. What if you've got transmission heterogeneities, imperfect mixing between susceptibles and vaccinees? So some susceptibles, they don't want to see vaccinees, or vaccinees don't want to see people that are unvaccinated. Well, this is this coupling parameter kappa here. And again, you can see can, if kappa is really small, then you can have an impact, but otherwise, susceptible is 
lots of them are getting infected. And it doesn't take much for lots of the vaccines to get infected too. And what about immunological uncertainties? So again, here, you might have some vaccines that are fully immune and some that aren't, right? So this is fully immune and this is the relative susceptibility to infection after vaccinal immunity. So you assume a fraction of the people that are vaccinated just won't get it and the rest are susceptible to some, some reduced rate. So you can see that depending upon what the value is, so these are two epsilons, not two different kinds of immunity, you will get a different outcome in both susceptibles and vaccines. And so it's important to characterize what kind of immunological status people have instead of just lumping them all together. Oh, you're vaccinated. Well, no, what's my immunity after the vaccine? And then, yeah, there's another, so another finding that I'll dis discuss is if you decrease onward transmission of breakthrough infections and you get qualitatively similar results, but obviously you dampen epidemic sizes intuitively. And so I'd like to close by illustrating, you know, a lot of this work is simple theoretical work with some grounding, with some seasonal transmission rates, et cetera. How can we tie this up better? How can we study this in the future? How do we know, how can we predict where variants might come from or what might happen? And so obviously it's gonna be crucial to know the cross scale impact of host immune responses. And how can we know that? Well, we can actually study these. And here's this perspective that we argue it's important to have these large cohort studies where you keep track of the vaccination status, keep track and sequence the individuals when they get infected and then know what happens and keep sequencing, keep collecting data on the serology. And when they're infected, collect data on the household transmission to know how infectious this potential variant is. And then obviously you want to estimate the impact of immune status on viral variants. And this should be done you know, in cohort studies across ages and degrees of immune competence. So you really get this broad spectrum, then you can potentially go back to these simple models and refine them and then know where we really are and get a better insight for where these variants are coming from, what might happen in the short, medium, and long term. And so some future outlooks that we've posed in this perspective is, you know, do immunologically cryptic individuals contribute to virus evolution? So this is a really interesting thing where some individuals just don't seroconvert. Do they have an impact on evolution or do they not? Are we missing something somehow? What about host immune responses? Do they influence evolutionary trajectories like other host immune responses? And then obviously that would tie back to the first question potentially. <clears throat> what about this idea of emergent pathogen spillover? Does population immunity create a cross protective firewall against that or how do you build this up? And then the, the crucial question is what's the relationship between transmission, immune escape, and clinical severity? And what are the possibilities for future viral genotypes? Where, and unfortunately, I think the virus is exploring these before we have time to really explore that. But uh, thanks to all the co-authors, the funding, and then thank you for listening and for the various Madhav for inviting me and Madhav and Balthazar and Chen for collaborating. It's been very uh, fun to be here. And yeah, if anyone has any questions, happy to take them. Thank you. I said a simple question. So when you were looking at the um, multi-dose trajectories, yeah. I didn't see, but I couldn't see that well. Okay, so it might be me. What the baseline is? What if we didn't have any vaccines? We just don't care. Yeah, yeah. So then, then you just go back to the original, the first model where you just. I'm gonna ask you step one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So initially, we just examined the case where you have no vaccines. Yeah. And I'm just so I didn't see that part. I think it can be late. So how does it? What is it like? I mean. Do, oh, does it slowly do people does it slowly become this endemic and it becomes just like flu or is it something that, that oh, goes differently in five years? Good question. So yeah, the short term, we can go right back. Yeah, so this is the synoptic landscape potential. Oh, yeah. Oh, oops. So you can see, depending upon where you are, this is again the top is without the vaccine. So depending upon how robust the natural or vaccine you need, go into the seasonal cycle. We basically just hop on to the seasonal cycle of the reproductive numbers. And then if it's robust, then you really do get these big waiting periods, almost case elimination, right? While the immunity, immunity builds up in these populations, can't really transmit much. It's very good immunity. Yeah. Okay. But if you don't, then it's problematic. Yeah. So in your consideration of vaccine asymmetry, the dosing, the, yeah, dosing the, and certain countries having oh, yeah, yeah. more ready access to vaccines. Have you guys can combine that with the thinking on immune pressure on the variant? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. So exactly. So actually in, in this here, it's 
So on the online tool, you can actually play with this stuff, but also here, the only one example where you have infection after wind natural immunity contributing more to potential viral adaptation, but the other scenarios are examined as well. And then you can, and you can also superimpose the dosing schemes on top of this and get like different that potential viral adaptation. Right, and so in that scheme of things, yeah. Are there scenarios that result in less immune pressure? If you consider the circulating invading variants yeah. or whatever you want to call them, yeah. are, there, are there schemes in which, and if you consider those invading variants as themselves, like a form of vaccination, right? Self-propagating vaccination that may place more or less pressure depending on the admixture in the population. Yes. The global, yeah. I was just curious if like... Yeah, so it's interesting. So we don't, in all of this, the variants implicit, and at least in this first three quarters of the talk. The variants are implicit. So here we just assume that there's a secular increase in transmission and that is the proxy for the transmission. Later on here, you have the variant invading. It's depending upon how much immunity the original variant does, but it's again sequential. So you have this first, you have vaccines and then you say, what if you have the invading variant coming in? You don't really have the competing types. So that's a good question. Like you, you could easily, I mean, it's harder to do because then you're going to have all the different cross parameters you have to right consider. yeah but it, but it is it is a good question and like what happens when you have different variants that are together existing at the same time and competing with each other right and then my last sort of thought question hybrid is in, in terms of all these parameter sweeps i think you mentioned it a little bit in the context of economics but and i know it's hard because there are all these things are clustered together uh the, with regards to long COVID, but the incidence of various acquired sequelae during the course of, of these landscapes of the parameter yep. sweeps. If you've done any sort of summative analysis over the estimates for how often you get pulmonary problems or heart disease or whatever, and, and relative to this game that we're playing out in this in this residence, right? So yeah, yeah exactly. stuff that, Like what's the long-term what's the long-term trend, trend of that? Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah, so that's great questions investigated currently in future works <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. yeah so there's lots lots to you know I'd be happy to discuss further yeah, yeah very there's lo lots of ongoing things that are yeah refining these and trying to address current questions yeah so in the vaccine nationalism uh, did you just consider two regions yeah so you can extend it easily to more it just gets a bit of a nightmare to know how much <laughs> So the way you can think about it, I think, is you just group, you could think there are going to be a lot of potentially interesting dynamics that interplay when you have more than two. But for the purposes of this, you can just group the regions that, that's why we don't call them countries. We just region where you have poor access to vaccine, region where you have high access to vaccine. And then obviously when you start actually looking at the policy aspects, then it becomes much more complicated. So we stay away from this kind of thing. But yeah, it's a good point. Like One could extend to end countries. Or Did you regions. also consider various levels of interactions between? Yes, yeah. So it's, you have some immigration as well between the regions, but part of it is assume you have no immigration. That's where you can get this, the nice analytical results. And then if you do have some immigration, then things get more complicated. And then obviously, if you have a third region, then you need to consider immigration between all three regions. It's a kind of a, a nightmare to think about, I think. But it's a good question, and it's very relevant, I think. Good. Just following up on what Abhijan was talking, and also I think a lot of parameters are talked about what could create these various variants. Personality is one, yeah. gaining of immunity, and then some of these patterns are emergence of new variants, yeah. which is a different kind of gaining of immunity, but like exactly the exactly. current variant. Exactly. Uh, but in, in the models, if you assume the variants are implicit, then it's, yeah. And uh, so my question, like for instance, like spatial aspects is another thing that yeah, is, yeah, yeah. really causes these. The way I mean, like some of it is seasonal, but also yes, just because of concentric patterns and like yeah, exactly. So have you explicitly explored the role of? No, it's a good question. Yeah, like the diffusion in space would be a good, good, good extension to study. Yeah, I was adding anything more. Yeah, yeah. Like, I can point to some of the data sets, like which are. Uh, I mean, yeah, obviously, I don't know, but from uh, more detail. Some of the but we also have aggregate representations which are posts that can be coupled with some Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So Shini, I think asked one of my questions. That's good. <laughs> because I think it's an interesting way to couple. Yeah, so, yeah. In your future directions, the one thing I thought 
that you were going to say that you didn't, you were interested in the genomic evolution in relation to human behavior. So, for example, oh, yeah, all yeah. SR's contact rate. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that something you want to play or is there work that you want to? That's a good question. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to see. Maybe one high level question just to get a context because there are so many of these domains that intersect. You build these models and for like you're going for model pass money in some sense and trying to extract high level insights. Yeah. So maybe you can talk through the process and also like how do you decide like this is enough from this domain or this is enough because like there are a lot of these domains that you span. Maybe that yeah you know, some insight into the process. I think it's complicated, I guess. Yeah. The the simpler the better for these intuitive insights, I think. But then obviously you lose all the realism. So then the more complicated, the better for <laughs> the realism and the predictability, right? So you end up in this weird spectrum where here we're just trying to show like guide your intuition right in one way or the other. And I think it's again like a lot of the choices are well you know without missing anything that might be of relevance to the question you're studying. Yeah, I also wonder if there's some kind of a moment on the scheme that space where more you get into that yeah. domain, like there's a point at which you'll get the maximum yeah. because there might also be like counterintuitive insights as you layer in one more level of exactly, exactly. And you can might exactly exactly. Not that I think that's very happens. that's why it's important to go to really do, you know, here is only one one slice of the questions, but I think building, and that's why I showed this original figure at the beginning, you really do need all that complexity to really understand the process. And I think you're right, you might miss something that's interesting that's happening at one scale by omitting the other. And so using a cross scale or very detailed approach really can give you much more of a, even qualitative insights, right? Because you, you might not, you might miss something if you oversimplify. I think you're, it's a very good point. To the policymakers, what do they think of this level of of yeah, so it, it depends on some, I think some of them really do, they, they like it, it guides their own intuition, and they're able to, you know, understand what are the key quantities that they should motivate, but I think some people, they, yeah, I think it's, and again, all it depends on like how their own background, I think, yeah, I think one should always be careful with their, with what they're assuming, so I think what we've tried to do is be very clear these are the different scenarios. These are assumptions. And this is what might, you know, what you can play out in the most crude way, right? Like this one kind of outcome or another kind of outcome. And yeah, some people have been really, really excited. The people that aren't very well trained in this field, but they get pretty excited by seeing that you can actually use these things. You can go online and, you know, do the play with the sliders and you can see, oh, the, the categories change, right? You, you see the impact right away. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting. Okay, I can I can ask maybe a couple of questions. <laughs> we more time, but it's okay. So first of all, really nice talk. Okay. And for folks here, I asked Shadi, you know, not knowing the details, I thought all of this was very planned set of papers that they wrote. They wrote <laughs> four science papers and at least three perspective articles. One in science, one in nature. Oh, the yeah, the review, yeah, the nature review, but you know, it's yeah. amazing. Shari tells me that it was not planned in, in the way <laughs> I, I was taught, so <laughs> it's amazing that it came together. But I like the fact that you could use simple models to still get rather interesting insights uh, into it, and it's a challenge. And, and I think for time, models will get complicated, exactly, so and they should be, and like right. rightfully so, right? Like, right. You should, but I think you should build all the realism, in. correct? But it's yeah, it's a, it's a debate. I mean, how much realism is needed to understand something at some conceptual level. So this is actually really useful. It's but intuition, I think. Yeah, yeah right. not really quantitative. <laughs> so I had a couple of questions. Maybe questions are not the right term, but I, I wanted to get your views for more the audience perspective. We have talked about it. One, Srini's question implicitly brings in the role of networks. Yeah, yeah. Which we feel... There's a very particular form of heterogeneity in the system. Yeah, and which is and the I think key, key thing to study. Key thing I think, yeah. And I wanted to get your sense for it. The second is our work with Balthazar on including behavior, which is, you know, you've taken sort of immunological and biological view. Exactly. Social view. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Is missing the economics and the behaviors. Exactly. 
something that we would like to extend if you're interested in, because I think that layer is important and COVID showed that. That's yeah, exactly, there. exactly. You start touching on it through hesitancy and nationalism. Exactly, and very, very simple. Based through yeah. inroads, but I think there's more to be done on that side. Yeah. And the last part is my sense from these models, and I want to ask you, have policymakers, you know, use, a lot of people have used your sliders, have people contacted you? I mean, a lot of citations for this work. Yeah. Have a lot of policymakers contacted you and what, how do they react and how do they work with the results you so have? So Ezekiel Emmanuel, the first, he was using it for something. Anyways, he contacted us. He was trying to use the app and then he, we did the vaccine nationalism with him. So he was really, he was a co-author and he was, yeah, he really liked this stuff. So I think that, and then you, so I think different people react differently. I think if they understand it, they find they really like, they find the simplicity kind of elegant, right? Because they can, oh, now I can understand if I move this parameter, this happens. And then I have an in intuition for why that might be, or I, I have no intuition and I gain the intuition by doing so. But obviously it's hard when someone wants a crystal ball, right? They say, what's going to happen? Can you tell me what's going to happen? Well, not with these simple models. That's for sure. <laughs> We're not fitting to data. We're not predicting what's going to happen next week, right? With these simple kinds of models, you know, it's like climate, right? So you're looking at long term, maybe or medium term, you know, longer. What might be the landscape in the future? You're not going into the details, and I think so. I think it depends on the, what the person is interested right. in. That's right. So yeah, the reason I ask is if I look at the work that this group did, which is spectacular on its own ways, but very different. It was directly tied to what policymakers were asking. So it was very operational. It's for yeah. a different form of science. It was very data driven. Our, it's complimentary. Our, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> customers would not need the concept, you know. Yeah. They are really keen to understand how can we deploy exactly. vaccine distributions? How can we deploy who to get the vaccine? Or what's going to happen tomorrow in terms of the disease state? Uh, their questions were short term and very policy oriented. Yeah. And if we do this, would it change something else? Yeah. yeah. Could we should we show it, shut down the school? So there is a rather interesting set of works which is forming, is my point. One which is driven by the questions that are present just now, and they're very policy oriented of yeah. a particular kind and driven by the data, somewhat short term outlook, relatively yeah. speaking. And its value of its own kind. And then these are more scientific questions. That have very deep value of a different kind of exactly. Different type. Exactly. The temporal scales of the value are different. Exactly. They give you a better conceptual understanding of the problem. Of course, you know what would like to meld in. Right. Exactly. But exactly. it's harder to do because you could not have done the kind of science that you were doing with yeah. these detailed or data driven models. And likewise, you can't do the kind of predictions and, and the vice versa. Needed information right. with simple models. That's yeah. right. Exactly. So and I think this is a question that drives us in a, in a bigger, us may not me personally only, but yeah, yeah. as us community, we should we're thinking because these are really different class of models. So our colleague, Yuri Leskovic at Stanford had a nice paper on data-driven modeling. His paper also gets heavily cited or written in 2021 or so. I bring it up only because he basically used data from SafeGraph to understand how mobility patterns are changing. Oh, interesting. And connect it to SR models to say, you know, which places should be closed and how much should they be closed. Oh, yeah, interesting. Right? Yeah. Been picked up, but it was a very, very direct assault on the question of what to do tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And very different form in some ways. So, do you have any thoughts? I mean, I'm rambling purposely because I'm trying to bring these two. Yeah, no, it's together. a good question. Something I because I think this is very important too, and then that one has that point. Yeah, if I can quickly add to that, I see there is another extreme. I mean, I think the kind of work that Manu was describing in our group, some of it also has a long, at least a medium term prognosis, yeah. which requires capturing some of these in more detail. For instance, the models that we run with the series scenario only up as an example, like 10 months, 12 months out, where we have to capture some sense of any immunity, yeah, yeah, escape, yeah. and yeah. That, forces us to understand the uh, internal states of the model, almost like what you do, like with stratified immunity and yeah, yeah. strain introductions. But I think there's the, uh, the other extreme is actually, I would say, if you want to put, put it in blunt terms, like the phenomenological models, which are purely dependent on the capture, uh, capturing the domain experts in these mathematical abstractions. And then the other extreme is starting from data and building immediately 
policy relevant predictions or analysis. That is the whole spectrum. I think like uh, Uriel Esquire is a maybe on slightly uh, center right. <laughs> yes. So yeah, yeah so there, right. there's farther distance than that is what I think. And how else is yeah one one more step. The reason I bring it up is because so for instance with Andrew and Balthazar and others and actually Simon, we are working on biosurveillance question broadly. But how it connects to our work, now very interestingly, we have learned from this experience and we have two strains of work. One which Balthazar is leading, which is based on, on this form of modeling. And then one Andrew and Safat and Anil are leading. And that's based on a direct form, which is using heterogeneity of network and taking the real data to drive the question. But even so, both are going towards this policy question. Basically, the way I see is much of the work, our work is very operations research related because it's about optimization. It's about you know, deciding the economic cost, uh, what to do next. It's very action oriented. It's a decision theoretic set of questions. These are scientific understanding style questions in, in some way. So we can, we'll share it with you, but I think this part is very important. And I think as Srini rightly said, as we develop scenario modeling hub models in the future, and I've told it to the, that team already once before to bring in Simon and Brian and you folks in, perhaps one of the things we would borrow from this model and essentially add to our system, uh, which is how we took the, we took SIR models and added to our network system. With our network models internally are just like SIR models. Actually, not very different at all, almost identical. But it was you this this kind of analysis that yeah. people have done is useful. So yeah, yeah. More a discussion to, to have had, which is I think a really interesting, interesting one. Yeah. Very interesting one. And I think the, the insights you folks got are, are quite nice. It's, it's a really beautiful actually. Oh, thank you. Like word. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I just <laughs> I wanted to sort of get this, trying to absorb it in a in a yeah, uh, no, manner. Yeah. Thanks again, Charlie. Oh, thank great. Uh, yeah, we should go. Uh,